much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for starting off our worship this morning. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent, the season where we get to prepare ourselves for the birth of the Christ child. Um, And so we have our Christmas decorations up and ready, and we uh, will light Advent candles here in just a minute. Um, But we always start the morning off with some announcements. Uh, First and foremost, if you walked in and smelled a faint scent of delicious lutefisk, it's because we had a successful lutefisk dinner last night. Do we know the total amount that we fed? One... 128. Wow. Yes. So at this point, if you were a part of planning or prepping or serving or cleaning up anything with the Lutefist Dinner, can you please stand up? Seriously, I'll point you out. I know who all did this, so just stand up. Stand up, everybody. There we go. Let's give them a hand. You can sit down now. You, yeah, can you be loud? Okay. Or here? No, I mean, here. I mean, um, I mean, it's like, our famous it's, cook. It's the day after the, our, our Lutefist dinner. I feel, it's like, I feel like a kid on Christmas morning. <laughs> I mean, how, how awesome is that? Um, I, I just want to say, uh, yeah, the, I guess the numbers were, I, th- I heard 137 or 128. I mean, that's like, that's, that's like, uh, that's like, 30, 40% increase from last year. So our, our event is, is gaining momentum. So again, thanks everybody that really pitched in, that, that um, embraced this, that supports it, that came, that tolerates it. Um, you know, Lutefus dinners, they're an old tradition, but they're a tradition, and traditions are important. We're people, and it's important. And we all realize it, especially this time of the year. So thanks so much to everybody that that gave the, the musicians, we had music this year, the musicians that gave their, their talents, and the people that worked so hard in the kitchen, and we had youth help, that was a big, big help. So thanks everybody for, for, uh, for embracing this. And thank you, Rolf. Last year, Rolf was the one who came into my office and said, um, okay, I have this idea, and I really don't know how to say it, so I'm just I'm just gonna blurt it out, okay? So just, and he was so nervous. Just, um, so, do you think we could have a Lutefist dinner? <laughs> and I was like, sure. And it has now been a growing event. And last night, people even um, many many people said it's the best Lutefist they ever had. It was better than last year. We don't know how he does it, but it's so good. We hope you keep doing it. So, Rolf, because of your idea and because of your determination to make this such a successful event, especially with well-cooked lutefisk, you, you made it a success. And we all just got to be along for the ride for it. So thank you again so much, truly. So next week, we'll start planning next year's. So I'll give you a week off, and then we'll start up right again. Okay, great. (laughs) Yes. I know I'm getting there. Thank you. There is leftover food from Ludafis Dinner. There's a little bit of fish. There's potatoes. There's uh, Swedish meatballs. And it's a free will offering. Is that free will offering for if you want to take any of the leftovers home? So if you didn't get any last night, and you want to bring some home and heat it up for a Sunday afternoon snack or your dinner tonight. Um, can they, where can they head? To the kitchen? To the fellowship hall? Just find the food. Find the food. It'll either be up in the window in the fellowship hall or down on the table in the narthex. So if it's not in one place, it's in the other. How about that? Great. Okay. Um, I want to talk about poinsettias really quick. Uh, We have decided that for poinsettias for Christmas this year, instead of doing a formal order for them, we are going to be doing a free will offering toward buying poinsettias for Christmas. So we have a beautiful basket that has poinsettia flowers attached to it, and that is going to be sitting out on the table where it will be monitored. So if you have um, funds that you want to put toward uh, poinsettias for Christmas Eve, 
Um, you can drop it in the basket. It'll be out for a couple weeks, but we ought to make sure we, whatever funds we have in there, that's how many poinsettias we'll buy. Um, and then what will happen after, Christmas, after the 10 o'clock service on Christmas Eve? No. No. Yeah, because we don't have Christmas Eve, Christmas Day service. So if you're here at the 10 o'clock, um, it's a first come, first serve if you want to take a poinsettia home with you. So um, we are doing, again, I know it's a little different, but this is what we can hold uh, joyfully and can do uh, well. So please make sure if you have any extra funds to put them in our poinsettia free will offering. Okay? Thank you, Jenny. Thanks so much. Um, our Advent Wednesday dinner uh, went really well last week. We had delicious pizza. It was really good. Really, really good. This week, we are going to be doing soups. Um, so if you want to come on Wednesday for dinner, come for soup. Um, and then the following week is a hot dish medley. We're showing our Lutheran pride, hot dish medley, the following week. Um, and then it's going to be Christmas before you know it. So, um, And then next Sunday is our live nativity. So uh, we want you to come and experience uh, the Christmas story of Joseph and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men and baby Jesus, um, the llamas, obviously, um, as well as a couple donkeys as well. So uh, Food and Festival is going to be offering hot dogs and chips and cookies and stuff and hot chocolate up in the fellowship hall for purchase if you want to come and have dinner too. But there's also going to be a bake sale. So since it's the Sunday before Christmas Eve, if you want to participate in providing cookies for the bake sale, but also then purchasing them for Christmas so you get a nice variety for your Christmas Eve or Christmas Day table, um, it, uh, that's going to be offered and available as well. So lots of ways to get involved and to come and just be a part of St. Mark's Thriving Ministry time um, out in the... Uh, parking lot with animals and characters, and then inside with lots of food to purchase and enjoy. Um, I think those are all the announcements that I have. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask you to remain seated because I'm going to have Rob and Margaret Crowder come up, and they are going to be doing the lighting of our Advent candle for our second week. And you don't have a microphone, do you? Can you read it? Can someone read it from there? The lectern? If we could turn the lectern on, please. Hold on. Are you, Mike? Are you on? Am I on? I think you're on. By the light of this second candle, we receive your comfort now. By your spirit, may all of the pain and sorrow that we carry be shouldered by this beloved community. We are not alone for you are with us and we are with one another. Through the power of mutual aid, we have everything that we need. Our peace comes through our willingness to share the abundance that you have given to us. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able for a time of confession and forgiveness. Mothering God, enfold us in your loving arms as we prepare to confess our sin and receive your forgiveness. We know that we need your comfort now. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Loving God, we confess that we have turned away from your comfort time and time again. We thought that we could go our own way and that we did not need you. We have made a mess of our lives and of our world. Have mercy upon us, we pray. Amen. Hear this good news. God forgives you all of your sin. Feel the loving arms of God wrapping around you now. Find comfort against God's bosom. Dry your eyes and be set free. Let us stand together, my siblings, as we cry, prepare the way of the Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's sing verses 3 and 4 of 257. And have the kids come collect quarters. So kids, come on forward to collect quarters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Messiah God, we acknowledge that we are unworthy even to untie your sandals. Yet here we are, comforted by your love and ready to share the good news that the kingdom of God is now at hand. Like John the baptizer, make us harbingers of your good news message, good news message, now and forever more. Amen. Please be seated. Kids, you can stay up here because it's our time for you to be up here. Okay? Come have a seat. Good job. Come have a seat up here. So we've said, we've said a lot of things today about, we've said a word a lot already this morning. And maybe you caught it and maybe you didn't. But the word for today is comfort. Does anybody know what comfort means? What does comfort mean? It, it can mean when you're uncomfortable, right? But what makes you then comfortable? What are some things that could make you comfortable? A blanket or a pillow or a stuffy? Yeah. What else makes you comfortable and cozy? There you go. Dragons aren't real. That brings me a lot of comfort, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so I have something to show you. I had a blanket when I was little, and I have held on to this blanket. I'm almost 40 years old, so I've had this blanket my whole life. So this blanket is almost 40 years old. And I'm going to show it to you because it brought me comfort when I was scared or when I was sad or when I was just feeling uncomfortable, right? I would spend time with my blankie or I'd sleep with it at night. Are you ready to see it? Okay. It's very well loved. Look at that. It's, it is my blankie. I had this my whole life. <laughs> Which almost looks offended. <laughs> but when it's when it's this old, it can kind of look like this. It was your blanket. It's not even. Your it still blanket. is my blankie. No, now it's just but it's still, but it still is my blankie. It's a blanket Have a seat, please. A I, you can call it whatever you want. For me, it will and always will be my blankie. That brings me comfort. But you know what also brings me comfort? People. People bring me comfort. Do you have anybody in your life that brings you comfort? My parents. Your parents. My family. Your family. Have a seat, though. Your, oh, your sister brings oh, you comfort. Babies. babies. Do you guys have friends that bring you comfort? Yes. 
Okay, good. Everyone I have, okay, so I have something to tell you. Guess what? One of my very bestest friends in the whole wide world is here. Her name is Tori, and she's right here. Oh, see, Mary just found her. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tori is one of my bestest friends, and she lives all the way in Colorado now. And so we get to spend, when we get to spend time together, it's very, very special. And Tori, I got Tori a gift to show how, how close we are as friends. You want to see? It's pretty funny. So come on up here, Tori. You guys may not be able to see out there, but we'll try. But um, I got these socks that have um, arms on them and eyes, and the arms have magnets in them. So when Tori and I stand close, they hold hands. Do you see that? Okay, let them hold hands. There you go. Isn't that so fun? I know. Let, us, let them hold hands. There you go. Yep. This is the kind of friends we are. <laughs> it's come to this. <laughs> but Tori brings me a lot of comfort. She will send me text messages just to check in to see how I'm doing. I'll send her. We talk to each other on the phone a lot. Hold hands. Okay, we'll do it one more time. Oh, let it, let it, it can, okay, you help. Okay. There you go. See, look. Isn't that so cute? So cute. I know. Tell your friends, tell your parents you want this on your Christmas list. Amazon. Aren't they so fun? But it's so great to have people in your life to bring you comfort too. Because we need to be able to, maybe we need a hug every now and again from our friend or from a family member. We need... But we also get comfort from God every single day, okay? And I think God shows up in people like friends and family that remind us of how much we are loved, not only by them, but by God too, okay? So I want to tell you how important it is to find those people in your life that bring you comfort, because I found mine, okay? You want to put my socks on? Um, not right now, because they're on our feet. They, brought, they might not fit your feet. Right, that's true. We have big people feet. Yep. Isn't that fun? So cool. All right, well, we're going to say a prayer. Hey, Winter, you want to come pray? Because then you guys get to go to Sunday school. You'll, oh, you'll be back. Okay, you just spend some time with Joseph and Mary. Okay. And if you don't want to go, that's okay, too. Are you guys ready to pray? Yeah. All right. Fold your hands. And then everybody repeat after me. Dear God. Dear God. Thanks for giving us comfort. Thanks for giving us comfort. In blankies, in blankies and, stuffies and stuffies and friends and, friends. and, family. and family. We love you. We love you. A, lot. A lot. Amen. Amen. Good job. If you guys want to ooh, head to Sunday school Sorry. with Trish. Nope. Okay. Be good. Oh Lord. Good luck. I didn't give him any sugar today. I didn't do it. I know he's walking now, you guys. I know. He's such a good boy. We'll continue with our reading for today. Today's reading is from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire? When in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you were waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace 
without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I ask you the question, where do you go for comfort? If I were to ask you to make a list of places you associate with healing or 
restoration and nurture, what sort of places come to mind? Maybe it's a cabin in the middle of the woods, or maybe it's by an ocean, or a mountain retreat, a favorite corner of your home, a silent retreat. In our readings for this second week of Advent, comfort resides in a place that we wouldn't expect. It's a hard place, a paradoxical place. If you seek the comfort of God, these scriptures tell us, head to the wilderness. And just to be clear, the wilderness in these texts describe, that it describes is not actually a wilderness of a pristine national park or a well-tended shoreline or the forest havens we associate with sleeping bags, campfires, and s'mores. Although none of those things bring me comfort, but that's just me. <laughs> the wilderness of the Bible is harsh and it's bleak and almost inhospitable. Its weather patterns are unpredictable. Its water sources are scarce. There are no established trails to be found amidst its rocky crevices. And if we want a path, we have to forge it on our own. The wilderness of Scripture, moreover, isn't really a destination we choose by ourselves anyway. Sometimes we're taken there against our will. By illness, or loss, or trauma, or hardship. The wilderness can seem like a place of captivity, a place of exile, and we end up there when our careful plans fail. Or when someone we trust betrays us. When the faith that we practice so effortless, effortlessly suddenly dries up. The wilderness of the Bible is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a place that we'd wish to inhabit. Yes, it is in this kind of hostile desert that God speaks tenderly to God's people. It is when we prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. When we make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That the promise of consolation comes. When we hear the words, comfort, comfort my people says your God. Our gospel reading, Mark, describes John the baptizer appearing in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. Well, that's, that's pretty good, right? John's message is aimed at a people living under foreign rule, and in this case, Roman, and the suffering the loss of autonomy and dignity and freedom. As we move deeper into our Advent season and consider what it means to wait for the coming of Jesus, these readings challenge us to consider hard questions about location. And why does Scripture ask us to dwell in the wilderness in the weeks leading up to Christmas. Why must God's comfort come to us in such barren, desolate settings? Why is joy hidden in the desert? Well, first, the wilderness is a place that lays us bare. It's a place where we must contend with our own powerlessness. In the wilderness, there is no safety net. There is no plan B. In the wilderness, life is raw and it's risky, and our illusions of self-sufficiency fall apart, and they fall apart fast. To locate ourselves at the outskirts of our own power is to acknowledge our own vulnerability, our own brokenness in the starkest terms. 
And in the wilderness, we have no choice but to wait and to watch as if our lives depend on God showing up. Because they do. And it's into such an environment that the word of God comes. Secondly, the wilderness softens us toward this word repentance, which I don't really like the word repentance. But when John the Baptist proclaims his baptism of repentance, he does so in the desert, away from the temple, away from the city, away from everything his listeners consider routine and familiar, or maybe even easy access. And why? Because something about the harsh, bewildering environment of the desert brings people almost to their knees. It shows them what, it really in their, what is really in their hearts. And it allows their hardened exteriors to almost melt away and to receive God warmly. I know that for us, sin and repentance can be loaded words. We associate sin with guilt or self-loathing, and we approach it with fear rather than confidence. But whether we like it or not, Advent begins with an honest, wilderness-style reckoning with sin. Is it possible that acknowledging our sin might become an occasion for relief. Maybe if we can get past our baggage and risk the desert, whether we go in there voluntarily or show up there involuntarily, we will find comfort in the fact that we cannot fix whatever our wilderness has brought us on our own. It is a place where God, who alone has both the power and the will to forgive us, can make us whole again. Growing up, I was taught that sin is breaking God's laws. But as I've gotten older, I saw that it assumes that sin is a problem primarily because it angers God. But God's temper is not what's at stake. Sin is a problem because it draws us away from God. It creates a disconnection from God. And in the wilderness, on our knees, at the very end of ourselves, we learn the meaning of resurrection. We are brought back together. The threads that seemed withered and torn apart or knotted become a smooth connection again with God. Lastly, the wilderness is a place where we can see the landscape as a whole. Unless we're in the wilderness, it's hard to see our own privilege and even harder to imagine giving it all up. No one standing on a mountaintop wants the mountain to be flattened, right? But when we're wandering in the wilderness, an immense barren landscape stretch out before us in every direction, we're able to see what privileged locations obscure. And suddenly, we feel the rough places beneath our feet. Whether it be tiny pebbles that have sharp edges, or Legos, if you've ever stepped on one. <laughs> we experience what it's like to struggle down twisty, crooked paths whether we put ourselves there by mistakes that we've made, because hmm, we've all made them, 
or we get put there because of an illness or the intense, immense grief of a loved one, and we don't know which way is up, and everything seems to be hurting us. We begin, once we see this landscape, to dream God's dream of a wholly reimagined landscape. Seeing God come to us. Not us trying to have to decipher and figure out who God is in this desolate wilderness. But knowing of the promise that God shows up wherever we're at to provide comfort and reimagination of what God can look like, even in the wilderness. Our Advent text this week assume that we are people in exile, a people wandering in the wilderness. You can pick your wilderness even. I won't even put you in a specific one. You probably already have one in your mind right now. Do you think this is true? Where are you located in this holy season of Advent? How open are you to entering the wilderness to hear a word from God? Knowing that hearing a word from God in your wilderness is possible. It's promised. Where is God leveling the ground you stand on? And what will it take for you and I to participate in that uncomfortable but essential work. God used John to prepare the way of the Lord. Bringing people into the wilderness as this strange looking man wearing camel hair and I will tell you on my trip to Israel Hearing him eating locusts and honey, he was not eating grasshoppers. Fun fact, there are locust trees that have seed pods, and he would use those, eat, he would take the seed pods off and eat the pods of the locust trees. So I'm sorry if I just ruined your imagination of John eating bugs, but he would pour honey on the seeds and eat them. But even John, this man who is probably seen as kind of an outcast, is drawn into the wilderness and people follow him. Follow him in there. Because God is up to something. Comfort awaits us in the desert. Especially in the desert. God promises to come and meet us in our wilderness. And I hope you can believe this. May we wander and may we be found and may we feel the comfort of God's arms wrapping around us tightly to remind us that God, Emmanuel, is with us even in the wilderness, especially in the wilderness. Like the prophets who came before us, may we be brave voices in hard places and receive comfort from our God who loves us a lot. Amen.
Together, let us confess our common Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With hope and expectation, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all who await God's day of restoration. Send forth your faithful people with words of promise and forgiveness. Teach your church to be bold in revealing your good news in word and in deed. Merciful God, prayer. turn the hearts of the nations towards righteousness and peace. Increase cooperation for justice between countries, commonwealths, political parties, and diplomatic leaders. In times of prosperity, direct leaders to be generous for the sake of all. Merciful God, comfort your people with tender words of love and healing. Surround all who are grieving, all who know depression or anxiety, or all who feel lonely or forgotten. Be a steadfast presence when all else feels uncertain, especially Connie and Dave, Carol, Jerry, Ted, Greg, Angela, Elaine, Cindy, Susan, Sue, Dave, and all others we worry and wonder about. Deliver all in any need. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Grant holy patience to all who are waiting this season. Give hope to those seeking employment. Bring reassurance to people awaiting new diagnoses or treatments. Protect expectant parents. Watch with those who keep bedside vigil. Merciful God, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for all our neighbors near and far. We pray especially for our brothers and sisters in Tanzania. Merciful God, hear our prayer. Listen to these and all our prayers, O God of hosts, and restore us with your great and everlasting mercy. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Let us take some time to share the peace with one another today. As you make your way back to your seats, I'm going to call upon our ushers to gather in our offering as we listen to the choir sing.
let us pray. God, our provider, by your merciful hand, abundance springs up from the earth. Receive and bless these gifts of your own bounty. Let them be a sign of your steadfast love and faithfulness for all people, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You comforted your people with the promise of the Redeemer, through whom you will also make all things new, in the day when he comes to judge the world in righteousness. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, and it's given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and it's shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Will you all please join me in our Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. These gifts of God are for the people of God, and all are welcome to join. I'm going to invite you to be seated as I call upon our servers to come forward at this time as I give you some brief instruction. Our ushers are going to guide you to come stand around our altar where you will be handed bread or a gluten-free uh, wafer as, as well as wine or grape juice. If you cannot make it up here for any reason at all, just let the ushers know, and we would gladly come and meet you at your seat. For those of you worshiping with us at home, please know that whatever elements you have, know they are blessed when you hear me say that the body and blood of Christ are given and shed for you. The table is ready, and all are welcome.
I invite you to stand as you are able. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace always. Amen. Generous God, in bread and cup you have revealed your glory for all people to see together. Nourished by this meal, send us out to proclaim your good news of liberation and release. Brought to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. One announcement I forgot to make is next Sunday for worship. Um, we'll have a little bit of normalcy in the beginning, but then uh, the remainder of our worship service is going to be our Christmas program. So we are really, really looking forward to that. So we hope you come and be a part of that uh, worship service um, with kids and adults alike. It's going to be glorious. So make sure you don't miss out. Receive this blessing as you go out into your week. The God of peace bless you. The love of Christ sustain you in hope. And the anointing of the Spirit remain upon you now and forever. Amen. Let's sing People Look East 248. Go in peace, keep awake.